Thank you, Kate. Um, every day, the news is full of stories of wars and of the associated human misery. Um, but these wars, they do come to an end, and many do so following the signing of a peace agreement. And this is what I'll be talking about today. Now, the conclusion of a peace agreement is typically marked by footage of men in dark suits, and it, it is almost always men. Emerging from these marathon negotiations, and you have international mediators patting them on the back, um, congratu congratulating them on their achievement and urging them to shake hands um, in celebration of having reached this uh, imp important um, moment of having concluded a peace agreement. And reaching a peace agreement is, is something that should be celebrated uh, because it is incredibly difficult. It requires courageous leaders, it often requires skillful mediators, but it isn't enough to get the parties to sign an agreement. It matters what's in this agreement. Um, it matters what kind of peace is created. If it is actually a kind of peace that will end human suffering, it could, for instance, be based on the continued ru rule of warlords. Um, and it also matters that the peace is lasting, that it is sustainable. Um, and this is crucial because the collapse of peace agreements can actually be more catastrophic than the failure to reach a peace agreement in the first place. Uh, the genocide in Rwanda was most notoriously the response of extremist forces to an unpopular peace agreement. Now, since the end of the Cold War, um, a significant number of peace agreements have actually been reached, uh, including in conflicts that were previously thought beyond resolution. And I have examined around 20 of these peace agreements spanning different uh, geographical areas and different types of conflicts. And I've looked at how they have addressed very controversial issues uh, such as territory, security, political power and, and justice. And I've been hoping to say something about what works, what should be avoided and what happens when you get it wrong. And unfortunately, they often do get it wrong. The kind of peace agreements I've been looking at, I've been looking at conflicts that were extremely violent, such as the conflict in Bosnia, uh, where nearly 100,000 people were killed in the space of, of three years, and most of these were, were civilians. But I've also been looking at nonviolent conflicts, um, because the settlement of nonviolent conflicts can be crucial as well. I've got this picture of Putin up here, because in the 1990s, um, a peace agreement was reached in Crimea, and that was thought to have solved that conflict. But there were significant flaws in this agreement. There were lots of things that didn't work. Um, and this provided an opportunity for Putin to reignite the conflict around uh, 20 years later. Okay, so what do these peace agreements look like? So I've looked at these 20 something different, different agreements. Um, and there are similarities, but I think first of all it's important uh, to note that although international mediators were involved in almost all of these conflicts, um, and they did have an important impact on the, the kind of agreement that was reached, but they very rarely dictated these agreements. Um, and this is even true uh, for a case like Bosnia, where you had the peace agreement was signed following um, an intensive uh, NATO bombing campaign. Uh, but still, although the mediators drafted quite a a lot of the agreement, the core deal was still something that the local parties um, in, insisted on. Uh, similarly, in the case of Sudan, which is another case I'm looking at, um, the, mediators, the mediators were apparently left outside the door uh, when the conflict parties um, negotiated um, a, an independence referendum uh, for, for South Sudan. And this was a great surprise. No one expected them to reach this agreement that this was not something that was imposed by the mediators. So we're not dealing with internationally imposed blueprints. Um, the specific <laughs> conflict context does matter. It's not mediators showing up with a model saying, this is what you have to agree to, this is what, this was what worked somewhere else, this is what you'll be doing as well. And there are very big differences between the agreements. Uh, for instance, if you just look at how long they are, well, some of them are only a couple of pages long, whereas others will span several hundred pages. But even so, there are commonalities. There is a dominant model that stands out. Now, the conflicts I've been looking at are all separatist conflicts. So there's a demand for self-determination at the core of these conflicts. And this is 
This demand is in all but one of the cases I've looked at, addressed by giving the, uh, the minority community um, a degree of self-rule. And this is typically done by devolving power to what used to be um, the breakaway region. So the Dayton Agreement, which is being signed here for Bosnia, um, that ended the war in Bosnia, cr created two separate entities um, and a very weak central government. And so the extent of autonomy varies, but it's found in almost all of, of these, these agreements. The second characteristic is that the institutions that result from this are very much based on groups. They're very much based on ethnic groups. Uh, so this goes for political power, it goes for security, it goes for um, public appointments to the civil service, to the police. Um, it's based on typically ethnic ethnic identities. So they're designed these institutions to give power and protection to the dominant ethnic groups in the country and importantly also to their leaders. What this doesn't leave a lot of space for is for individual rights um, or rights for non-dominant groups. Uh, so for smaller minority groups or for marginalized groups. Uh, so for women for instance very often don't, don't play an important role in these these peace agreements. And there's also an almost complete lack of accountability when it comes to crimes committed uh, during the conflict committed during the war. So even though most of these agreements, they talk about human rights, they're written in the language of human rights, they'll promise to protect and uphold international human rights, it ha this has very little substance, it has very little impact on the institutions that are created, which was something that surprised me. This was not what I thought I would find when I, start, when I started looking at them. Now, I should, of course, acknowledge that it's easy to criticize these agreements, um, and they are, they are invariably imperfect. They're often negotiated at great haste. Several actors may be involved drafting different parts of the agreement, um, and of not all eventualities can be, can be planned for. It's not possible to come up with a perfect agreement. Another problem is that in most cases, you'll find that the post-settlement period will be marked by violence, even in case of more successful agreements. Um, and of course, this makes it hard to distinguish between successful and unsuccessful agreements. Um, but, but nevertheless, there are some common problems that you can identify. There are some shortcomings uh, that you find in these agreements that tend to lead to tensions and sometimes to the collapse of the agreement and to the return to war. One of the problems that I have found in a lot of these agreements is the frequent use of what Henry Kissinger up here has referred to as constructive ambiguity. Kissinger, he argued that con uh, constructive ambiguity was needed during negotiations um, because through that, through wording it, an agreement in deliberately vague and ambiguous terms, both sides could think that they had won. They could both think that they got exactly what they wanted from the agreement. Now this is great when you're negotiating an agreement um, because of course it makes it easier uh, to get the parties to accept the agreement. But it's not that great later on. Uh, it creates a lot of problems in, in the post-settlement post phase, in the implementation phase when you actually have to see well, what can we do with this agreement, what it's going to look like in, in practice. Um, so one example of this, but you find it in a lot of these agreements, um, comes from the conflict in Mindanao, which is in the southern Philippines. Um, an agreement was reached here in, in 96, and the core of this agreement was that the region would gain significant autonomous powers. Or this was at least what the, what the rebel forces and the local population thought, but this is not what happened, uh, because it was extremely ambiguous, especially when it came to the special or separate police force that the region was meant to have and special army units that they also thought they were going to get. They didn't get that. Um, the government could use the ambiguity to fail to implement well, what these ex these, or live up to these expectations. The problem was that there were significant rebel groups against the agreement and they were strengthened by this and eventually war broke out again. Another problem concerns the narrowness of most of these agreements. They're typically negotiated in secret. When these dark-suited men emerge from negotiations, sometimes this is the first thing that people knew about negotiations even taking, taking place. And also the, the, the groups or the actors involved in these talks tend to be the men with the guns and, and not really any, anyone else. And the agreements that result from this 
tend, therefore, to only benefit a, limit, a limited number of groups, a limited number of peoples. People. So it lacks, agreements tend to lack wider legitimacy. The idea is that this can come later. You can, you can make sure that everyone buys into it later on, but the problem is, I would argue, that this makes them less resilient to the kind of problems that you will encounter in the implementation phase. For instance, if you have a very ambiguous agreement, which you do in, in most cases. The other problem with this lack of wider legitimacy is that it, it contributes to, well, to an additional problem that you find in many of these agreements, which is a lack of capacity in these autonomous regions that are typically created by these, these agreements. And this is crucial because in many cases these regions are also meant to be responsible for their own security. They are made, made to make sure that uh, that groups that are opposed to the agreement don't become too strong, that hardliners don't become too strong. That's part of what these autonomous um, authorities are meant to, meant to in, ensure. But they might not be able to do that. And one example of that comes from, uh, from, from Israel Palestine, where the Oslo Accords, part of the, one of the main objectives of the Oslo Accords was to defeat Hamas. This was the objective both as, so, as far as the Israeli negotiators were concerned and the Palestinian negotiators. Um, and, and it was up to the Palestinian autonomous authorities to, in, to ensure this. Um, and I'll just quote, give you a quote from um, Rabin, who was the Israeli prime minister at the time. When he was selling this deal to the Labour Party, he said, I prefer the Palestinians to cope with the problems of enforcing order in the Gaza. They will <coughs> rule by their own methods. So this was the intention. The problem was that the Palestinian authorities lacked the legitimacy and they lacked the resources to do so effectively. And as a result, Hamas was actually strengthened rather than weakened by the agreement. And this is not unique. This is something that you see in a number of cases where you have, where these autonomous regions become characterized by violence and by instability and this spreads uh, and this makes the whole agreement uh, unstable. Now, you probably wonder if these problems can be addressed. Is it, I already said that you can't come up with a perfect peace agreement, but can you do something about this? Can you avoid these common pitfalls? Well, I would say yes and no. Problem is, I think that some form of self-rule, some form of ethnically defined autonomy um, is usually necessary, at least in the more bloody uh, conflicts and this does create constraints and it does create a genuine dilemma between group rights and individual rights but it is possible to make it better it is possible to design or at least it should be tempted to design peace agreements that are less ambiguous despite what Kissinger suggested um, especially when it comes to the core deal of the agreement but also um, agreements that ensure enough resources to these autonomous areas Central governments are typically very afraid of this because they're afraid that they'll just try to secede again, uh, that conflict will break out again, that they'll use these autonomous uh, regions to create sort of proto-states and then they'll just try again later on. That hardly ever happens. What happens much more often is that they don't have enough resources and via internal violence breaks out. Uh, so this, those would be two things I would suggest. And then I would suggest that as far as possible the process and the resulting agreement should be broadened. It shouldn't just be the men with the guns who negotiate. Other actors should be involved as well because that affects the kind of agreement um, that results. And there are examples of this. There are examples of alternative models, alternative processes that give different kinds of agreement. And one example is provided by a region in, in Papua New Guinea called Bougainville where you had a very violent, very long-lasting conflict um, that ended in the signing of a peace agreement in 2001. Um, but this, the peace process differed from what you commonly see uh, in these cases because it, it took a lot longer, it was deliberately slow, um, and also it was a lot broader. It included a lot more actors, uh, it included women's groups, it included civil society, uh, because the point was to get an agreement that was lasting, not some short-term uh, 
ceasefire that then becomes permanent, because this is otherwise what often, often happens. And there was also an emphasis on reconciliation and stability within Bougainville, not just between Bougainville and the central government in Papua New Guinea, but within the region, um, the region as well. This doesn't mean that the agreement is, is, is perfect. Um, it's actually very ambiguous uh, when it comes to an independence referendum that is meant to take place within the next five years. But it does show that there are alternatives. There are other ways of doing it, and they can, um, they can sometimes succeed. Um, because the content of peace agreement does matter, and it is important to get it right. Um, waging peace as I entitled this talk, is incredibly difficult. But a peace agreement is also a unique chance to achieve fundamental changes uh, and address the underlying causes of a conflict. And this is a chance that's unlikely to come back. Thank you.